Okay. So just make sure that that's on mute. The <laughs> the Twitch broadcast. Twitch, yes, yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Here we go. And welcome back, everyone, to the U.S. Amateur Team West Scholastic Championship. This is round three. My name is Abel Talamantes, chess director at the Mechanics Institute. And I have a very, very special guest with me, uh, Lauren Goodkind, whose uh, Team 100% Lady Chess Moves won the under-1800 section at the U.S. Amateur Team Championship main event. And uh, she's... Uh, very generous to give her time to hang out with us and uh, help me call round three. How's it going, Lauren? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for ha um, having me. Very cool. And uh, congratulations to your team, uh, uh, all-female team, winning the uh, under 1800s. It was you and your sister Barbara. And uh, who are the other two? Are they just uh, friends or people you know? Um, I met them through um, the Facebook chess group. Mm -hmm. um, um, and. It's an all babies um, chess group, and um, that's how I, I found them. Very cool. And yeah. uh, you are a uh, chess coach, and you you have a lot of chess students that are young, and yeah. uh, you even have a student uh, playing this tournament. Uh, yeah. What do you think of an event like this, uh, like a scholastic team event? Because a team event is not something that uh, – scholastic players get to participate in uh too much because you know the chess tournaments are usually you know regular swiss style um but it's uh it's a lot of fun to see the kids playing an event like this uh did you ever play like a team event when you were a young up-and-coming player i don't think i did i actually started playing tournaments late when i was i started playing tournaments when i was 15 years old so it was on the late side um but I think that the team event, I think that's a great opportunity for young people to participate in. Um, I mean, I've played in the, the team um, tournaments like in the past, and I think one fun thing about it is, I mean, you got teammates, so um, you guys have to, everybody has to work together as a team. And the other thing is, um, there's, Oftentimes, like there's one session, so like in one round you can play somebody way above your rating, and then in the next round you can play somebody way below your rating. So you don't know who you're gonna be playing again. Yeah, and we had um, international master Kesav Viswanida and Arjun Bharat, national master from the UC Berkeley team, and they were telling stories when when they played. You know, they could have a, a round where they they'll lose to a lower rated player. But then in the next round, they'll actually have to play a much higher rated player just because you never know uh, who the board yeah. is on the on the next team. Yeah, but I find I find that um, I find that um, to be a very unique experience. And then I cause I know like a couple of years ago, like I remember playing against a twenty three hundred, and then the next round it was a thirteen hundred. But it's it's fun. It's fun to do that because if you play um, in like a regular tournament. Um, I don't think you can get that opportunity. Right, because it's just a very different uh, event. And we're, we're taking a look at board one on the first table. Uh, the white team is the Fallon War Horses. They're playing the Dublin High School Gales. And uh, Champ Shivam, who is playing white, is from uh, the War Horses. Uh, against Dublin High School, uh, Dab Pac-Man playing black, and it looks like black's got a blistering attack going here. Right. So I see that the um, black has the bishop and the queen, and the queen is attacking the g2 pawn. But okay, so white um, moved the queen to f3. So we'll see what happens. Um, usually, um, actually, maybe black needs to trade queens right now because I noticed that the queen um, and the bishop on c1 are also attacking the bishop on c1. <laughs> right. It's hanging. So, It'll be hanging if they don't trade it. Yeah, so I think I think a queen trade needs to happen here. And that, that would sort of be great for white, right? Because white was under some pressure here 
being attacked and now you trade the queens you're going to alleviate it uh except that black uh, will still be up a pawn when it's all said and done right yes i tell i tell my students if you are attacking um you want to avoid trading queens and i always also tell my students like if your opponent is attacking you should try to trade queens um to evade the attack so so I'm, yeah. Um, so, one other thing I, I noticed is so White's rook is on e1 and it's on the same um, line as the pawn and that's king. Okay, so we trade it. Oh, wow. But that's bishops are um, very powerful. Okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. And well, it looks like four White's pawns. Yeah, yeah, so right now, um, I like that position right now. Black has a lot more pawns than white right now. So let's look at this game that is, I think it's on board three of this matchup between the Fallon Warhorses and uh, Dublin High School. Okay. It's uh, RF Goel uh, for the Warhorses against Samyak Jane and... Uh, Look at this position for white here from Arav. Whoa, wow. Okay, so white um, has two pawns on um, this six and the seven. That's pawn on D7 and um, E6. And these are two really powerful pawns. Um, notice that the bishop on G4 is protecting the pawn on um, E6. The white's queen is on c7. It's attacking the pawn on d7, um, the pawn on c6, and also um, that's with on d8. So Zach is um, in trouble right now. And uh, this is the board two in this match. In this match, uh, Cassius Lai for Dublin High School against Eric Zhao for the War Horses. Mm -hmm. Looks like he's up a black is. Like the exchange, well, whites up the exchange, yeah. and some pawns. Mm -hmm. And I also, noticed, yeah, I also noticed that white also has a pass pawn on a four, so perhaps um, white can maybe use that as an advantage. Um, so it's an interesting position. And on this top table, the board four game is over, and it went to uh, Anshul for the War Horses. So uh, Fallon War Horses leading in that match uh, with their board four victory. I figure uh, since uh, you are an ambassador for uh, Girls in Chess, uh, let's pull up some games from some of the girls in the tournament. And here is one of them. Uh, Black is uh, Josie107. This is Jocelyn Wren. Uh, oh. Playing Lemon Juice 99. Wow, okay. Let me switch the okay. orientation there. Okay. So when I um, look at this position, it's a, it's a middle game. Um, so I noticed that, in um, fact, so Josie has a pawn on E4. That's, it seems like a pretty powerful pawn. I like, it seems like white is trying to attack maybe, well, I noticed like white's rook is on g3, and it's on the same line as the um, black pawn and the king, but I like how um, black has a rook on the open b file, mm -hmm. so that's, that's good, um, so, but I think like anything, I th I mean, there's, a, there's still a lot of play um, um, that's it right now, so we'll, we'll see what happens. And uh, both of these players are uh, 1,000 rated. Um, I believe Lemon Juice 99 is the brother of Fide Master Eric Yuhan Lee. This is, uh, this is Andrew Lee. So uh, he's got a good uh, coach as a brother. So, uh, so let's we'll, we'll keep an eye on this game as this game develops. Another player that uh, we want to keep an eye on, and I'm just trying to find the game because uh, she's been doing 
really well, and she already won her game. It's uh, Jashith Karthi, who's been playing a lot of the mechanics tournaments and uh, taking a lot of the mechanics classes. This is her third win in a row in the tournament. Jazz, Jazz Fork uh, wow. beating Lucky Banana, so she's doing really well in this event. Uh, That's awesome. Thus far. And so many games have already ended. Like, about more than half the games of this round have already ended, just to give you an idea of how quickly uh, <laughs> the games just uh, disappear. Um, yes. I mean, I, um, I mean, kids, they tend to move quickly. So I, I do believe, like, that's why maybe half the and, and here's another game that ended quickly. Adichie. Yeah, so Adichie is one of my students. Right, and got okay. made on the board right there. Wow, okay. Well, congratulations to um, Adichie. That's a, that's a really nice checkmate. Right, so yeah, he, right there in the middle of the board. That bishop taking away all the dark squares. Yeah, so... So he used um, his two rook. So notice that um, um, that king cannot capture the rook on c5 because mm -hmm. the rook on c1 is protecting the rook. So, um, but also this um, checkmate it was possible um, also because of the bishop on g3. Mm -hmm. The bishop is uh, um, controlling the d6 square, so that means the king can't go there. Um, and the can the king can't also the king can't go to e5 because of the bishop. But also notice that um, the pawn on e3 is controlling the d4 square, and then the king can't go to e4 because of the knight, and then the pawn on f um, f3. So that's a, it's a really nice checkmate. Very good win, <laughs> right there. So let's. Uh... I'm like flipping around trying to look for some games. Look at this one here. This is uh, <clears throat> Tasty Celery 7, which is uh, Dominic Matar uh, from Hillsboro playing Ugandan Knuckle 7. Oh, wow. Interesting position here with uh, Rook and Bishop versus Rook and Knight. Wow, okay. So... It seems like White has, It seems like White is attacking, and that that is defending right now. So, can White um, find a way to win, or is that going to find a way to successfully defend? I mean, it looked like White was putting all the pressure, but can't really see how to continue it, mm -hmm. unless you do like a four maybe to try to come around the other side that's interesting so yeah I see what you mean pawn at a4 and then if that pawn takes it then the rook can take the pawn on a4 oh well I actually did that it's played right. yeah so, um so what I was saying is that if that takes the pawn then we can go to a4 and then the rook right rook can go to a7 and check the king and once the king gets out of check, then perhaps White can trade rook. So. And we'll see. The time control for this tournament is game in 20 plus 10. So there's a lot of increment. Um, we've only seen a few players really take advantage of that and, and use their time, which is always a skill that's tough to build sometimes. Uh, that's important, <clears throat> yes. And I, um, I mean, I know that kids, they tend to move quickly. I tell my students, think before you move. Um, kids tend, like some kids tend to move um, without thinking, and that's a huge mistake. So I just tell, I tell my students, just like, I want you to just take your time, um, just ask questions. That's really, really important. And then once you ask questions, then you get, you, you have to well you have to ask questions such as like um, can I safely capture a piece um, if I move here where is my opponent gonna do um, so once you ask questions then um, you you have to answer it and then once you get those answers then that will help you figure out where to move 
And uh, actually, the answering questions uh, reminds me of your latest book, Queen for a Day, which I just put up in the Twitch chat. Uh, you can buy that from Amazon. But uh, tell us a little bit about that because you had uh, Judith and I read, you know, the the original uh, before you published it. And uh, we wrote a testimonial about it. And the one thing I really loved, you know, especially being involved in scholastic chess, is that, you know, you, you impress the need to ask the question, what is the reason behind that move? And uh, I think that's what the kids really need to do in, in practice is you got to sort of have this inner conversation of why did they do that instead of just what am I going to do next? Um, that's true. Um um, yeah, like p people need to ask questions before um, they make a move. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is, yeah, so this is, yeah, Queen for a Day. Um, there it book. is. Um, I wrote this book to um, inspire more women and girls to play chess since chess is a male dominated game. And, but even though I wrote this book, for women and girls, um, men and boys can benefit from this book. But in this book, what I do is I give the reader three choices for a move. So one move is a good move, um, another move is a bad move, and then, and then the other move is a, um, like the best move. Um, but you have to really look at the position and just really think about it. Um, but this is a very unique book because you get to play an entire chess game with Sophia, and this is the picture of Sophia. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's a good book. This book is for beginners, and I realize like, if you're a beginner, you might not know what a decent chess game looks like. Um, so this book, it just teaches you um, um, basic winning strategy. I think it's a good book. And like you said, it, I mean, anybody can read it and uh, benefit from it. Uh... Uh, it's not just for one. And R of Goel has just won this match, uh, the this game, uh, which is interesting because uh, R of USCF rating is uh, is uh, 628. He just beat Samyak Jane, who's uh, 1358. So, wow. so this was like a big upset and an important match because the Fallon Warhorses won on board four. They've won on board three. Uh, the Dublin High School Gales top board won. So the game here between Cassius uh, Lai, who's who's black for the Dublin High School Gales, and Eric Zhao for the War, War Horses, if black's able to get a draw, this would be a pretty big upset uh, on the top board. Um, but uh, it is... Black is uh, behind, it seems, right now, the exchange. Uh, possibly a lot more coming. Yes. So when I look at this position, um, once, I'm, well, Black Hat should take the bishop. And then once Black takes the bishop, then White's rook on b2 can capture the knight on b7. Right. So now we're up uh, a lot. And then. Then I know this, like once the rook, now <laughs> one is threatening checkmate right That's now. That's right, on g7 over there. Uh, so if you get your rook um, on the seventh, then that's really, really powerful. So white is in an attacking position, white has a really good position right now. And, and white needs this game in order to uh, draw the match. Uh, oh. After boards three and four loss, it looks like one and two is going to make up for it. Uh, and uh, bring in the show. Let's move on to another game because this looks uh, quite challenging. Okay. Here's Knight Templar Zero playing the Mighty Dragon One. Let me switch the board orientation there. Okay. Um, so I noticed that this is an in game fight. Um, White's rook is on a7, and White also has um, um, a powerful pawn on c6, and also a pawn on b5, um, also a pawn on a, b3. So, and White also has a strong knight on um, e5. So this, I, I do like White's position, 
and might just needs to figure out how to convert um, one of um, his pawns to a queen. So we'll see. And uh, there's literally only like six games or so left in the round, believe it or not. But uh, this is one of them. Look at this attack here. Okay. Maybe like, one thing I, that comes to mind is... Oh, wait. Oh. Um, okay, so Plaque... Okay, well, Plaque is um, threatening checkmate on... <laughs> and that happened, yep. Yeah, so. Mate on the board. There you go. Another game in the books. Right. And uh, check out uh, another blistering attack we have going right here okay. by Robbie No Dude against Shining Crystal. Okay. So, yep, yeah, White has a strong attack on um, both of us. Oh, okay, that just happened. Like, yeah, they traded, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, this bishop, was so White's bishop on b3, it is pinning the pawn on f7. Oh, okay. That's a mistake because now White's Rick can just take the um, pawn. Oh, I missed that. Oh. Missed that. <laughs> yeah, missed that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he should have just taken the pawn on g6 because the pawn on f7 can't take it because the bishop is pinning the pawn. Right. Taking. Now you can defend it. Yeah. yeah. So now. Um, Tactics! Side. Even in the chat. No! <laughs> Gonna play Rick g6. I might probably, yeah. I mean, if I was black, um, I would move the king to g7 to get out of the pen. Yeah. That's what that's what I would do right now. Yeah. That's yeah. So that's what he did too. And then, um, but now white, I know black has to be worried about the pawn on a five right now. Right. It's just marching um, down. No. So. Wait, if Rick, if the back Rick goes to a eight right now, I don't think that White can defend the pawn. Right. No. no. And it'll actually be defending its c five pawn after. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what what Oops. is um, White gonna do now? Sorry there. So Chuck King can go to f six, and um, I don't. If if I was back, I would try to fight for for a draw. Um, because I mean, if you're white, it, do you think that white can win in this position? Uh, not. I mean, not unless you could get that uh, a pawn storming all the way down under in, uninterrupted. But uh, I mean, I would look for the. I I would be thinking more draw than you know. What can I do to win? Although. The one thing that would like pique my interest is playing a move like bishop f7 for white. Uh, oh, that would be really powerful. Looking to attack that, and uh, I don't think you can defend that, actually. Yeah. Um, but maybe white needed to do a6 first since the rook defends that uh, pawn. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but now king... King of Force played, so that may not work anymore. Yeah. So White can White can now safely just take the pawn on G6 right now. That's right. And That's right. That's true. And then that means that Black um, has three pawn items. Three, three isolated pawns. And this is not good pawn structure for Black right now. Because it's easy to attack, right? Because the, there's not a pawn that can help protect it. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. I mean, I think yeah. one good thing about Black's position is Black has a pass pawn on F5, but I think it would be really difficult to try to promote that on to the queen. And there are only three games left in the round. Uh, this is one of them. Um, another one is this one. Back uh, on board two, we were following this game. Uh, White still comfortably ahead. Okay. And the okay. 
Yeah. Yes. So Zach is fighting for a jaw right now. He's down in the exchange. Um, so, okay, so Zach just moved there. The king is attacking the like so White needs to do something about the rug. I, in this position, oh, I see. So, um, perhaps the light rug can go to um, E8 and maybe go to G8 or um, H8 to attack on that spawn. Oh, actually, no. Okay, so he went there. That's good. I see that Fox Bishop can go to F1. Yep, and, it's and has played. On, um, the Fox Bishop, yeah. So I don't think he can, well, he can maybe save one of them. I would go G3 right now. Just give it up. Yes, that's what I would do. And, uh, right. yeah, go ahead. Oh, so if I was white, I would definitely um, try to promote the A4 pawn to the queen. That's what I would try to do. Just push that pawn along. Let's, yeah. let's go back to this other game that we were following with the Shining Crystal and uh, Roby No Dude. Mm -hmm. Let me switch the orientations. It keeps getting confusing. There we go. Okay. Gonna be tough. So let's see what's going on right now. White is in a winning position right now. So if I was white, um, I would go, let's go rook to b7 to attack the rook. Um, the rook, yeah, that's what this way um, happened. Notice that the bishop on f1 is protecting um, the a6 pawn. The pawn, yeah. And then I was, I think, yeah, just go with the r. And then that's, um, I would move the rook back maybe to um, you, g7. You can just go bishop g2 check also. Oh, yeah, you can also do that too. Actually, you can just, yeah, that's pretty much the game right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now rook c7. Yeah, rook to c7 now. Yes. Let's see if uh, Roby No Dude sees that. Okay. I have confidence that yeah. uh, tactics will be uh, seen. This is this is a this is a powerful um, tactic. Um, the rook goes to c7. The rook is checking the king, but also notice that the bishop is on the same diagonal as that rook. So once um, that gets out of check, then White's bishop can take the pawn on a8. So played. White sees that. Yeah, so he does. Good. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead. The and like you say, you just take the rook and then just uh, pull the bishop back, and then you're going to promote, right? Yes. If you take the rook, right? Yeah. And then that's easy. Yeah. Well done by uh, Roby No Dude. Yeah. And then I think both games are going to end uh, shortly because uh, this is the position in the other game. Uh, yep. Okay. And, yeah, so white, white should win in this position. The rook is attacking the bishop. Once the bishop um, moves, then white wow. can just promote the pawn to the queen. And uh, just to see the ending of that game with uh, Jocelyn Wren, she beat... Andrew Lee and uh, just look at look at this attack here uh, oh. brings the rook to the seventh rank and you were just talking about that yeah and then so, yeah congratulations to her so yes if you can get your rooks on the seventh then um, the rooks are really powerful that's a really nice um, checkmate 
and uh, white is just bringing all the forces here. Yeah. And the one thing is even white needs to be careful about not stalemating back. Right. That's, that's pretty common. And that's what I tell my students, like even though, well, I, I tell my students, like, even if you're completely winning and if you have a couple of queens, you still need to be careful about that stay on mating. We, right. we actually had a game in round two where it was dangerously close. It was king and queen versus king, and uh, uh, the player was having a little bit of trouble doing the last sequence and uh, avoiding stalemate, but he eventually did get there, but it, it was a little worrisome there for a while. Yes, you have to be careful. And um, I'll tell you one story. A long, long time ago, I was playing an all-women's tournament. And I remember, like, I promoted I, I didn't have that much time. But I remember, like, I, I, I promoted my pawn to a queen, and I accidentally stalemated my opponent. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was not a good feeling. And, and would you, if you had promoted to a rook, would it have been okay? I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. But I just remember that I moved too fast. Yeah. So that's why I'm telling my students like, you gotta just slow down. But, but of course, like, if you don't have that much time, you have to move quickly because if because you don't want to lose on time. But if you have lots of time, then take advantage of that and just take your time. That's really, really important. Then. And Cassius gets the win. Hey, Alexi. Uh, Alexi Root says hi to you in the chat. Oh, hi, Alexi. Thank you for joining. But uh, the round's over. I think that <laughs> I think that was the last game. And uh, Cassius needed that game for his team, and he got it. So there was a draw on the top table, uh, <clears throat> which is an upset. The uh, Fallon Warhorses get a draw against. Uh, the Dublin High School Gales. <clears throat> it looks like in the uh, second uh, table, <clears throat> the Dublin High School Kings defeated the Fallon Sandwiches two and a half, one and a half um, for there. And then uh, table three, the Bright Chess Dragons against the Fallon Knights. Let's take a look at that. And then uh, Bright Chess, Knights, Bright. And the Bright, wow, Bright uh, Dragons got the win. It looks like 3-1. to one. So we'll see how the uh, pairings shake up for uh, the fourth round. I think the fourth and fifth round is where we're going to see the, uh, the best teams start facing each other. And what, what was it like for you, Lauren? Because uh, I'm sure as you got into, there were six rounds in the Amateur West. Once you got to round three and four, like things got really tight. It got really tight. Um, it was interesting. So the first round, we actually drew um, a, rating, um, a team that was under our rating. Um, that, so it was a rocky start, but then rounds um two three four and five we did win but i remember <coughs> one of the rounds we we barely won with two and a half points um so that that was really tough um but like i had but my team was very strong and in the last round it was really interesting because we we played against the tranquilizer team mm -hmm. and that actually happened to be my I'm just doing this dad's team. Right, that's right. You playing Ramachita. <laughs> yes, and it was it was really <coughs> interesting because I because so Mama he played against my teammate Daniela, and um, the game it was a, it was a French defense, and this is just this is kind of a funny story, but I taught um, Aditya um, like a French defense trap, uh -huh. and then Aditya. He taught the French. Um, he taught that trap to his dad, and then when Rama played Daniela, um, Daniela fell into the exact French defense trap. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Almost felt traitorous or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, but 
I thought that was the, I thought I thought that was kind of a funny story. If if um, if I remember that game, because we were watching it, Daniela looked like she had played this great move, this night move that sort of like blocked defense of a rook. So she actually w was up the exchange. But what ended up happening is that she was up the exchange, but then it, it put her position on a rocky level. Um, so we were saying like, wow, that was a fantastic move to play that. But then in, we're looking at it and like, oh, wait a minute though, but the position's actually uh, tough to play. Um, I'm not sure if that was the uh, uh, the game. I think it was though. Uh, very interesting game because we were following because uh, you guys were the only two undefeated teams, right, at the time? Yes, I actually on uh, my game um, finished early, so I was able. Right, to watch, you won um, quick. Right, um, games and. I remember seeing Daniela's position. Yeah, I remember like um, Miyama, he had his two books, I believe on the A, no, I think it was the A or B file. And then I remember when Daniela um, moved her knight. And then um, I thought that her knight move was really great because um, Daniela found a way to win the exchange. So I thought that um, Daniela was winning. Right. But. It was still a tricky position because Amrama still had more pawns than her. Right. And yes. that was the game. She actually played a great move to get, win the exchange. I think it was sort of by accident where, like, that was a fantastic move. And then all of a sudden, like, I don't think he meant to sacrifice it as the exchange. It just happened to be that the way the structure was that actually Rama had a lot more play. Um, in the game but uh yeah that, that was a really good game and judith's in the chat saying that uh, it's a testimony to your teaching that you <laughs> taught the trap and then it got used but it says something uh positive about uh your teaching techniques just didn't go oh. the way you had planned <laughs> this time around thank you yeah it's kind of funny it's like it, it, i mean it's good to it was good to teach the trap but i didn't know it was gonna <laughs> work against you so Lauren, thank you so much for uh, joining us for uh, round three and uh, and taking the time. I know it was short notice. I really appreciate you coming on and and hanging out with me and uh, being a part of the uh, kids event. Thank you. Um. Well, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It was fun um, to comment um, commentate the games and um and um I hope um um I hope the um, yeah, I hope that the tournament continues to go well. Well, uh, a lot of people at Mechanics root for you. A lot of people in the uh, chess community root for you, and uh, we certainly root for you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for you to come on uh, the broadcast, and uh, we look forward to doing uh, more with you in the future. Sounds good. Okay, thank you so much, April. Thank you, Lauren. And everyone, the next round starts at the one thirty, but we'll start the broadcast of round 4 at uh, about 1.40, and we're going to have WIM Ashrita Eswaran and National Master Michael Wang from the UC Berkeley chess team, and they're going to hang with me to call the final two rounds of the U.S. Amateur Team West Scholastic event. We will be back here in the broadcast in about 20, 25 minutes, and uh, we will see you in a bit. Bye, everyone. <laughs>